coming up next, we have a deep dive into EY Ops Chain 4.0. And it is, it is kind of scary and amazing for me to think about the fact that we are actually at version 4.0 of Ops Chain, um, a product that we introduced, uh, well, basically four years ago. Uh, and in fact, the R&D team that you saw prior previously, Duncan and I, were kind of the original authors of, of Ops Chain 4.0, uh, or 1.0. 4.0 is our first solution that is built on the baseline protocol. And it's got a couple of really amazing features. It's the first ops chain version that we've ever built that serves both public and private blockchains on the same code base. It's the first version of, of, block, of our ops chain product that has not only zero knowledge proof core for privacy and the transfers, but it's also our first use of um, zero knowledge proofs around uh, business logic and, and obfuscating that on the public mainnet. Uh, and here to give the introduction is, uh, and, and to, to lead the discussion is our lead developer for Opting 4.0, which is AJ May. Now, AJ and I practice, we discussed our introduction here today. And uh, one of the things that AJ wanted to know was, will I give him a half-baked, insincere compliment so that he can awkwardly receive it? And, um, and so that is what I'm going to do right now. AJ, uh, I just want to say one of the best things about you uh, and your ongoing work here is that you do come into the office. Thank you. Thank, thank you, Paul. I actually thought the plan was the other way around, where you were going to give me a wholehearted compliment and I was going to give you a, yeah, you know, your shirt looks okay, too. But we could go. Are you okay, so let's, let's, try, let, no, let's try it again. Let's try it again. So AJ, okay. I, I cannot tell you how incredibly grateful I am for the way in which you have driven uh, this product forward, you have delivered it, and you have, have, have built this foundation in blockchain.ey.com that is so incredibly scalable. Your leadership has been outstanding. Thank you, Paul. Your leadership has been pretty good as well. You know, that warms my heart, AJ. Please take it away. Thank you, Paul. So as Paul mentioned, I'm AJ. I'm the project manager for OpsChain and also for blockchain.ey.com. If you're interested uh, in blockchain.ey.com, please stay tuned. Uh, my team is going to be sharing more information about that in the following presentation. I do want to thank everyone for joining today. I know this was probably a very difficult choice between this and stress baking. Um, and if you've been following along for the past few days, I know that you've probably heard a lot of mentions of both option and the baseline protocol already. If you've been wanting to learn more, this is definitely the right place. We're going to take a closer look at both of those things. So let's take a look at the agenda. First, I'm going to be passing off to Karthik and Patrick. They're going to provide us with a deep dive into the baseline protocol and Radish 34. Radish 34 being our first reference implementation of baseline. Next, we're going to hear from Will. He's going to talk about how and why we decided to take OpsChain, which is our flagship blockchain application that enables enterprise companies to do business on the blockchain and make it baseline compatible and make, uh, move it to the public Ethereum mainnet. Finally, Marco is going to tell us more about OpsChain. He's going to talk about the product's vision. And after that, he's going to give us a brief demo of what the development team is currently working on. If you have any questions during this presentation, please submit them through the Q&A feature in Zoom. We're going to pause after Patrick and Karthik's presentation on baseline and answer the questions that you might have about that. And we're going to pause again at the end of the presentation to answer any questions that you have about OpsChain. Before I hand it off, though, I want to take a quick look at how we got to where we are today. So after, over the last few years, we have been able to do a lot on the blockchain. We've tracked everything from wine to vaccines. We've notarized documents, including medical records, and we developed smart contracts to calculate royalty payments to game developers on the Xbox platform. We've been taking everything that we've learned and we've been utilizing EY's deep sector experience in our development of OpsChain. We have an amazing blockchain research and development team who you just heard from who developed Nightfall to enable the transfer of tokens on the public blockchain with privacy using zero knowledge proofs. We've partnered with Consensus and Microsoft to develop Baseline, which is taking Nightfall to the next level and enabling business processes on the Ethereum mainnet with that same level of privacy. And today we're announcing that we're upgrading OpsChain to be Baseline compatible and that we're going public and moving OpsChain to the public Ethereum mainnet. And we're not stopping there. As you'll hear from Marco, we have a long list of features and functionality that we're going to be rolling out over time. Without further delay, I'm going to hand it off to Karthik and Patrick to tell you more about the baseline protocol. 
All right. Uh, thanks, AJ. Uh, this is uh, Karthik Swaripuram. Uh, I have been playing the role of a solution architect on uh, the baseline protocol. Uh, to uh, let's start off with, uh, I'll go off, uh, go about with introducing what the baseline protocol is, uh, what some of the driving factors are behind how we came up with the, uh, the baseline protocol, uh, and then go on to explain what the specification is all about. So we start with uh, first the motivation behind uh, how we came up with baseline. Uh, about a year ago, uh, EY Consensus and Microsoft uh, met together and planned for uh, a plan for creating solutions or opportunities or levels for enterprises to be able to deal with the mainnet in a way that private business logic as well as uh, uh, data integration and other aspects out of them are covered. So I'll uh, go over each of these individual aspects uh, in this slide. So starting off, one of the key dimensions is privacy and security. One of the main aspects that enterprises are concerned with is that the data that is existing in legacy systems should never leave the enterprise ecosystem. What that means is uh, essentially what uh, any data that is uh, bound or native to legacy systems, uh, that data should never leave the systems in the, or even if it leaves, it should only, it should be masked or represented in a, in a manner that it can be consumed. So uh, you've heard of uh, efficient methods in the, uh, in the previous conversations around hashing and commitments and so on. And we'll go over some of those details as we go over the few following slides. So, uh, so as important as it is to protect the data to uh, and mask it or encrypt it in a manner that it, now, uh, it cannot be deciphered on the public on the public mainnet, it is also important that the data interchange and transformations, i.e., like any mutations that happen on the data or any transformations that happen on data owing to internal business processes, they are private and must be verifiable. The second aspect is legacy data integration. A data consistency is one of the driving factors that uh, driving factors in a distributed uh, environment that has been a major driving factor for uh, for coming up with baseline. So essentially, what data consistency means is that if multiple parties are interacting with one another, or multiple enterprises are working with one another to conduct day-to-day -to -day business operations, uh, it is important that uh, uh, systems of record or sources of record are consistent across organizations. So any changes that are happening upstream or rather external to the organization must be uh, seamlessly synced. At the same time, uh, any, any changes that are happening in the local system must also be synced to the external environments. And uh, a key aspect of this is that there are many uh, different standards and ways and interfaces to uh, be able to inter uh, interface or have a layer of integration between multiple enterprises. The idea behind baseline or the, the main motivation for a legacy data integration was that there should be easily adoptable industry standards, depending on different domains or sectors or verticals to be uh, to propose uh, to come up with new directions or uh, standards for enabling enterprises to attach their legacy systems or to interact with the mainnet. Then third thing is mainnet. Mainnet is also, is also called as public Ethereum is essentially uh, acting as a common frame of reference uh, such that any enterprise systems could be able, uh, could synchronize their uh, legacy data systems to the mainnet and in such a way that mainnet as acting as uh, a distributed mass data management uh, solution the other aspect of mainnet is also the fact that there is smart contracts as we all know and uh, as we go over uh, the following slides, I'll cover as to how we are using some of the leanest form of smart contracts to be able to cryptographically verify the truths about business processes. And finally, uh, scalability and governance. Uh, the, one of the issues that we see in, uh, in adopting any new solution or any form of IT transformation is that new solutions as they come about uh, they're rigidly architected and they're, uh, they're fit, in, fit in in such a way that it only fits for one solution or one enterprise or one uh, sort of uh, set of organizations. So the idea is that with baseline, we wanted to come up with a specification where it's a pattern based approach rather than a one solution fits all approach. So the approach must be based on modular architectural components and also must be uh, must address the scalability aspects of upgrades that might happen to smart contracts or upgrades that might happen to the integration aspects with the uh, with respect to data systems and also the overall uh, uh, the overall uh, concern or overall uh, direction towards how ethereum also is scaling up towards the ethereum 2.0 
So with these set as the basic underlying motivational principles, we'll move on to uh, explain what the baseline protocol is. At the core, baseline protocol is essentially a specification or, uh, or a set of libraries and framework components that would allow enterprises to interact with public blockchain in a private manner. So what, what does that mean? Essentially, where we've heard uh, several conversations over today around how uh, privacy can be maintained on public blockchain using commitments and signatures and proofs and so on. So I'll go down uh, to uh, go, go down to explain each of these uh, in, in somewhat more detail. So let's start with the setup. So based on protocol is essentially talking about any multi-party organizational setup where a group of organizations is conducting business with and across one another. Uh, and it also uh, cir uh, uh, cir circulates around uh, three primary features or three primary areas of technology or technology interaction. Blockchain, which is the main net in this case, a privacy preserving, a privacy -preserving technologies, and a secure, a secure way of communicating private elements of private data. So as I explain this protocol, uh, I'll break down it into key libraries and components. And each of these components also can be looked at as sub protocols or sub schemes. Let's start with the first one, commitment. Commitment uh, essentially is a cryptographic primitive where data is hidden or committed to a certain value uh, and, only, uh, and only revealed much later. It is essentially designed to ensure that values are selected in a particular order. In the previous conversation, we had in the previous discussion uh, that the, the R&D uh, team uh, provided, uh, you can see how uh, commitments are uh, universally used across different schemes or across different uh, ways in which token transfers are getting affected. So the idea behind uh, establishing commitment as a basic uh, primitive, or even for that matter, expanding on the basic primitive and building a library component around it, is that how would uh, a most general form of uh, commitment interaction or interaction to create a commitment would look like. So in a bio, uh, if we take down from the multilateral setup and go one step for one, le one level uh, lower, essentially we talk about a bilateral setup. In a bilateral setup, the question we have is, can two parties communicate private data with each other such that no one party gets to determine the other's data? So uh, uh, giving a brief primer on commitment, commitment has essentially uh, comes, it's, it's a sub scheme in, in, the, in, the, in the context of baseline, but it's, a, it's an established cryptographic primitive or a protocol, which has two phases, a commit phase and a, an open phase. A commit phase where a prover makes a commitment to, uh, to, to hide the private data and then with a random salt, uh, and then a, pro an, a, a, a prover provides an opener to the verifier to be able to open the secret data available. So the main aspects of the committing phase is about the fact that there is a hiding aspect or the hiding property, wherein the verifier attains no information about the private data uh, in the first phase or in the hiding phase, which is the commit phase. And then there is a binding property where you have a prover not able to uh, produce any false combination or any false secret uh, or uh, incorrect secret, which essentially uh, commits to the same value. So all in all, commitment is a very abstract, uh, a very math, uh, a cryptographic primitive, uh, cryptographic way of defining uh, what a hashing function is. So hashing uh, is a one-way function, ensures the hiding property, and the aspect of collision resistance of the hash ensures that the, the binding property is ensured. As uh, it was covered in uh, the previous conversation, uh, we, uh, we went over uh, SHA-256 and MIMC, uh, and there are many other types of hashing algorithms like that. So uh, in the case of baseline, the idea is that we come up with a, a generic way or a generic component in such a way that commitments or uh, these private data elements are communicated in such a way that the private information is not revealed. And an example hashing scheme, for example, in this case is uh, the SHA-256. Now, while there are other uh, choices, depending on uh, different businesses or different uh, 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 different enterprises may choose uh, to uh, may choose different hashing algorithms or may choose different hashing schemes. So depending on that, uh, the commitments itself, we want, uh, the idea is to make it a very generic library component where there is a choice of choosing several commitment schemes or uh, even uh, choosing commitment scheme one versus one on off chain versus one uh, on on chain. So an example would be, for example, in case two uh, parties in a bilateral setup are agreeing on terms of a business agreement or a business relationship, 
uh, a commitment will ensure that the terms of that business agreement are intact. The next aspect or the fundamental component is the uh, zero knowledge compliant signature, uh, signature generation and verification. Um, so what, so the, in, in general, uh, uh, what, uh, what we've noticed is that uh, anytime enterprises enter into business relationships, typically there are agreements or there are uh, agree uh, so, or there, are, there is a mutual consensus on agreements uh, in bilateral or multilateral setup. More often than not, uh, digital signatures are used to, in, in a traditional world, to be able to uh, sign off on documents when more, more than one party agrees to those terms. So zero knowledge compliant signature generation is essentially taking the concept of digital signatures and enabling them with privacy preserving properties in such a way that they can work with the public Ethereum uh, and the EVM itself. Uh, and this particular aspect is where uh, various modes of signature verification and generation schemes come into picture. Uh, uh, again, in terms of a general component, uh, this is an API, uh, an API which essentially ensures that any form of digital documents, or sorry, any digital documents could be signed and verified using specific schemes. Uh, now, these signature schemes have, uh, uh, there are various type of signature schemes that are used in different uh, public blockchains. And the one we are focused on, since it's around public Ethereum, we've been uh, looking uh, closely at uh, Jubjub. And uh, this, uh, uh, now, now similar to JubJub, there are many other signature verification schemes. Uh, so this, the idea behind having a general endpoint or a general API spec for a, uh, for a signature verification is to ensure or is to enable enterprises to be able to not just deal with uh, uh, hashing the data, but also verifying the data under the, uh, uh, and without non-repudiation. Then the third component is more of a framework component or a framework, uh, which is essentially a composition or a sequencing or an ordered sequence of components or libraries itself. Here we talk about the proof of business uh, process execution that can be verified on chain. Like for example, if you wanna prove that an agreement and its terms were signed by an internet party, it's essential that uh, the sub components like the uh, commitment of the particular document Proving the fact that it is uh, proving and verifying the fact that it is uh, that particular document is uh, signed off by the internet parties, and ensuring that the internet parties' information or private information is never revealed, including their identity. So this process or this component is essentially a, a combination or a composition of multiple components, which enable a basic spec for a workflow process for businesses to be able to use uh, these sub components. Uh, to enable uh, private business logic execution on the mainnet. Last but not the least is secure message communication. Secure message communication essentially talks about a person to person or peer to peer uh, private communication. The underlying data elements or secrets that are used either in terms of creation of commitments or zero knowledge signatures or even any other forms of uh, secrets that need to be communicated uh, those need to be uh, the, those need to be uh, created in such a way that they are modularized, and also the capabilities are available to an, uh, to have a general form or a general method for communicating these private messages. So, secure message communication between entities is another uh, core feature or a core uh, component of the baseline protocol itself. So now that we have established some of these specifications, uh, let's go on to how uh, uh, how uh, any enterprise or any set of enterprises or groups of organizations, as we laid out in the setup, can work uh, can work with one another. So we talk uh, we have taken uh, the concept of some of this uh, throughout the process of coming up with the baseline protocol and the specification. One of the driving factors uh, is from scalability and governance point of view. We need to take into account uh, some of the existing uh, EIP standards and ERC standards out there. So one such ERC standard that has been employed is the ERC 1820, which is essentially a global registrar. So the global registrar serves two purposes. Uh, one, uh, it is to ensure that, that there is a common registry on the mainnet for different organizations to be able to interact with each other or different entities to be able to interact with each other. Not, not only is this a registry for different contracts, but also it's a registry for different interfaces. So a work group or a set of organizations may decide that a certain interface is more applicable to them or a certain way of conducting business operations and uh, dealing with data elements and putting them on the main net uh, in a hashed forms or proof forms are all uh, specified and customized uh, for a certain set of organizations. 
Uh, now, the, when these interfaces uh, need to be published or then these interfaces need to be standardized, there needs to be a work, common working set. So that common working set is where is how we uh, is, is enabled by using the ERC-1820. So the ERC-1820 contract is essentially a global registrar and that is used as a part of the deployment model. So at the outset, uh, a an ERC-1820 registry contract is deployed and all the different contracts that are necessary for, uh, uh, for business operations are associated with that particular ERC-1820 registry. So given that, a work, uh, let's define a work group as a set of organizations that conduct business with each other based on mutually agreed terms uh, and uh, to terms and rules of the relationship. And the different types of contracts in this case are uh, uh, like, for example, here are organization registry and a set of shield verifier and Merkle tree. So the idea here is to come up with the most lean set of uh, smart contracts in such a way that business logic or the execution of such business logic is not uh, exp exposed sorry, on the mainnet. So what this means is that organization registry, for example, is like a name registry and it's a simple, uh, or uh, the intention is for it to be acting as a simple phone book of sorts. So it can maintain uh, metadata or information about uh, who the organization is or their, uh, or, uh, their, uh, their GUIDs or any identifiable information about organizations for them to interact with one another. Then when you come to shield and verify contract, uh, this goes into the concept of mixers that is uh, widely used in, uh, in Zcash and also has been used uh, efficiently in, uh, in other protocols, including Nightfall. The idea behind shield and verified contract is to essentially enable uh, the aspect of uh, hiding or hiding as in uh, ac accumulating or having set membership groups. So what, is, what does that mean? What it means is that uh, just like how we have had commitments where essentially we, when we talk about commitments, we talk about a hashing algorithm, which essentially hashes to a value. Now, a, a, a Merkle tree is a, is a type of an accumulator, a cryptographic accumulator, which is another primitive, which is essentially used for, uh, uh, used for hiding sets of commitments. What that means is that in a commitment scheme, once a prover sends the secret and a salt to the verifier, the verifier can open it and verify the message can open the commitment and open the committed message and verify it. Now in accumulators, prover would only send parts of sets of messages instead of the entire message. Now this was illustrated very well in one of the, in the previous conversation on uh, that R&D gave around how uh, just providing a sibling path or a sibling route to, uh, to, a, to a particular uh, leaf or a particular position in the Merkle tree is sufficient instead of actually divulging the entire Merkle tree itself. So, uh, so Merkle, Merkle tree here is one uh, is an example or a one such implementation of uh, a one such implementation of an accumulator to prove set membership. Essentially, to say that uh, it's it is only a set of messages that can be verified, and also the inverse is possible, where prover can prove to verify that some messages are not a part of the committed set. So, essentially, Merkle tree is an implementation of a, of a, uh, of, a of an accumulator. And that is associated with the shield contract to be able to store state changes of the business process. The concept of the verifier is, uh, is essentially follows from, uh, in the Ethereum world at least, it follows from the Byzantine, Byzantium fork of EIP, uh, the, which is the EIP 198. And that is a, a essentially provided means for uh, a verifier or uh, any on off chain, sorry, any on chain verification in such a way that any constant size proofs could be sent to, a, uh, to the mainnet, and that could be verified using some standard or some pre-compiled elliptic curves that have been uh, implemented in Solidity. So all in all, the smart contract artifacts here uh, in the most basic minimal set introduce a registry for organizations uh, for, uh, as a name registry, and it has a set, uh, a verifier, which is essentially, again, a sort of a registry for uh, the verifier contracts. And then a shield uh, contract, a generalized shield contract for uh, uh, a generalized shield contract for um, uh, and proving set membership and uh, and also disproving set membership. So in such a way, when the uh, the idea here is that when the organizations would want to start their business processes with baseline protocol, work group is one formal way or one recommended way of uh, beginning the business process. 
So with that, I'll pass over to Patrick and uh, and then he'll go over like some of the concepts around how a business workflow can be instantiated or can be looked at with the baseline protocol as a specification. Cool. Thank you very much, Karthik. Uh, my name is Patrick Makem. I've been a blockchain developer at Ernst & Young since I think it started doing blockchain stuff. Uh, I was working with um, Karthik and uh, the folks at Consensus and Microsoft on the baseline protocol. And here I'm going to walk you guys through a very uh, bare bones basic implementation of it. So uh, Karthik has kind of already gone over a lot of the, um, the definitions of these, but I'm going to just kind of talk or focus specifically on the process itself. Uh, I'm going to strip out any opinionated tech stack stuff as much as possible, um, and I'm going to get to that a little bit later when we talk about our own uh, reference implementation of it known as Radish 34. So in this uh, instance of this chart here, we're going to uh, make a couple of assumptions even before this chart starts. Uh, one of which is that the contracts have already been deployed onto the mainnet. Uh, each of these parties have already set up their own environments. They have uh, configured everything on their local systems to point to those contracts. And there's party A and B uh, on this network. There might even go up to party Z. Uh, but for this uh, example, we're just going to deal with both party A and party B. So uh, they may have already went back and forth privately through a secure messaging channel, um, various terms for an agreement that they would want to zero knowledge group. So that's where party A and party B have already kind of come to some agreement at this stage. And party A is going to start by generating a, a, a commitment. Right? They, they sign this commitment and then they privately message it to party B. And party B, uh, receives it, they look it over and make sure that everything is valid. This is the correct circuit. These are the right parameters and values that we hope to zero knowledge group. And they confirm it. They just sign it themselves and then they send it back using the same private messaging network. Uh, party A receives it. Now they have both all of the, they have the payload, they have the data, they have the, uh, the circuits and they have both signatures. They can go ahead and generate a proof at this, at this stage. So, <clears throat> This process can take a number of minutes, um, and when it's finally over, they get a proof. The proof is then shared with the other party, and at this stage, either party can verify uh, through the data that they have off-chain, as well as what is on the blockchain, that the exact circuit was called with the, uh, whatever business process it may be. Um, so uh, with that, like this is an entire baseline protocol workflow we would consider. This might be just one small piece of a larger workflow that might include a lot more steps, but this is just a single little piece of what uh, a protocol um, action kind of is. Uh, we can move over to um, how now us as uh, EY and Consensus and Microsoft went ahead and implemented this simple workflow using Radish 34. So first off, we generated a lot of Docker containers, <laughs> uh, each of which are, uh, have a very specific intended purpose. And this is not only to uh, you know, separate concerns, but to allow for scalable solutions down the line, particularly in the area where zero knowledge proof actually has to occur. There's a lot of processing power, some hard drive space and other things that might need to be scalable depending on the amount of workload or need of the system. But to start off at the very top of our little chart here on the right hand side, we have all of those contracts that have been deployed that Karthik was mentioning earlier. And in the lower box is what Radish 34 is at its very core. Um, at the top of this little diagram here is the API, which is the, um, the gateway or the entry point for um, any of the legacy systems that you might have, any ERP system, SAP, anything will be able to interface directly with um, the Radish 34 API. Uh, through GraphQL, just any mutation. It doesn't have to be GraphQL. I think there's other options of uh, webhooks or any RESTful API calls can do. Uh, but once the API receives a request, um, it goes ahead and uh, it, it messages the um, what we, uh, a queue system, which we put into place, which we just use as a very lightweight one, uh, known as BullJS, but we expect other people to implement any other queue system that they want. Uh, the queue system is then, um, <clears throat> it just sits there with that request. Now, uh, if it's to send a message, the messaging container will pick from the top and actually send the message. It comes back, uh, passes it to the API. And the API is in charge of just 
maintaining the order of that larger process that we just saw on the previous slide. So um, if any errors or things that do pop up, it's up to the API to be able to handle that. They have to know, do I want to retry something or should you know, I send a message or uh, there's a number of things that should be invoked at any number of uh, stages there. And in the area of the zero knowledge proof, as I was mentioning earlier, it can take quite a little bit of time to actually generate a proof. So um, in, to avoid race conditions and various things like that, the, the queue system is really critical. And it really helps a lot uh, with everything. Um, so uh, I think that's pretty much all of the containers. Um, we do expect um, in the future for some of these to be swapped out with other technologies, right? So it is a reference of implementation. It is not um, a prescription. This is just how we decided to do it. Uh, you know, uh, minimal viable product in order to achieve this 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 uh, process here. So you can you don't have to use MongoDB. Everything is just there to be replaced or modified. And we're uh, really expecting the community to get together and and kind of iterate over this to get the best achievable outcome for all of it. So if you want to jump in, I highly suggest you check out the baseline uh, GitHub and, uh, and and jump right in uh, with the. You know more. Uh, let me see. I'm going to pass it off to Karthik to uh, explain the ongoing initiatives. Thanks, Patrick. Uh, so as Patrick was covering, uh, we uh, leveraged uh, the ideation behind uh, uh, the baseline protocol or the baseline specification to have a reference implementation like Radish. Um, the as we are uh, ever since baseline has uh, been released into public domain. Uh, a lot of brilliant minds and community members have been actively contributing towards it, ideating and uh, ideating on new ways and new means for bringing enterprises closer to the mainnet and improving upon the evolution of the baseline protocol and the spec itself. So I'll start. I, I'll cover two areas of uh, of interest. Uh, one, uh, the ongoing initiatives uh, in terms of development areas and community efforts. Uh, I'll start with development areas. So there, are, uh, there have been uh, quite a few, uh, quite a few concerns, issues, and also uh, improvements proposed as a part of the work uh, ever since uh, the project went into the public domain. So I, I try to broadly classify these across three or four areas, and uh, I'll go into each of these areas and uh, talk about some of the ongoing efforts. So we have privacy management. Uh, so while uh, it's important to ensure that data is, uh, data is uh, resilient and also uh, hashed or proofed on chain, it is also essential that the identities of the people involved or the entities involved or the enterprise involved, their, uh, uh, that identifiability as a concern is addressed. In the sense, uh, any issues in terms of being able to associate a certain business action with a certain entity is something that needs to be uh, uh, needs to be further uh, further addressed in terms of separating away the uh, execution of the private elements and uh, security of the data, and also around how it gets executed on the mainnet. Uh, and associated with that are the compliance concerns. So there's ongoing work to uh, essentially identify ways in which identity of customers or identity of entities can also be masked further while keeping in mind around the uh, various compliance concerns. One of the areas that uh, the baseline protocol or the baseline specifications group is also looking at is building reusable components for repeatable setup and proof generation process. The, and finally, around the security, storage, and computational efficiencies around usage of multiple circuits, how to handle uh, using multiple circuits, and also areas of research around the same. Uh, we, uh, we've been having a great amount of feedback and also participation from uh, the wider community out there, including the likes of uh, conversations, including the likes of uh, Aztec and, uh, and other uh, companies out there uh, to make this uh, go further. Uh, business identity and discovery is a key uh, area of concern for these uh, in terms of identity management and how enterprise would deal with business identities and discoverability on the mainnet. There are existing standards programs uh, like decentralized identity management, like the one like, like the one in Element and so on, which essentially provide for verifiable identity. So uh, some of the ongoing work over here is to enable a framework or establish a framework for the organization registries to manage delegated actions for enterprises. This, uh, this further brings about how uh, organization registry or any form of organization conduit 
could be extended uh, for uh, not just decentralized identity management for discoverability, uh, but also managing of permission systems and access control systems under zero knowledge. And, uh, and as a part of this, uh, we have been working, there this active work that is going on in terms of how would, what the standard business workflow configurations would be and how enterprises could tie uh, their internal data elements to uh, on-chain private uh, processes. Uh, in terms of process sync and messaging, uh, this is a, uh, another area of uh, concern or another area in terms of data consistency and legacy data integration. Now, uh, in, as Patrick was covering, one, one, of the, uh, one of the things that we used in Radish was uh, use of uh, something like Whisper. Uh, and we, the idea of using Whisper and the idea of scaling it up beyond Whisper is to enable a highly available and a low latency uh, form of a distributed peer-to-peer -peer messaging service in such a way that they are identifiable URLs and for naming conventions for discoverability, but also in terms of maintaining process synchronization. So active work is on bound here uh, around usage of uh, various other technologies, including NATS, uh, for enabling process sync and messaging in such a way that uh, there, is, there are delays in terms of synchronization between databases and also uh, security in terms of communicating uh, the secrets of the either of the commitments or the private elements. Uh, there is active work over here and uh, over, that's going on over here and various uh, other technologies like WAC and uh, ERCO are all being uh, ERCO are all being used or all being uh, researched right now. Uh, finally, the smart contracts management. Here, I, I, we, the business processes to, uh, to leverage tokens or tokenized architectures or tokenized uh, hierarchy models, uh, a token hierarchy models are something that is active being, actively being looked upon. Uh, with, uh, uh, with all the knowledge base and uh, uh, bright, uh, bright insights coming in from the likes of Truffle and Etherline. And building a common framework to not just manage smart contracts for, uh, in terms of the upgrading smart contracts in terms of changes so to organization registry or changes to say, for example, the shield and verifier contracts or even changes to the ultimate way in which uh, things are, uh, uh, things are uh, ultimate way in which actually a business process could, uh, could take advantage. So for example, new work groups may be set up, new rules may come up, and at that point of time, how do we scale up, not just in terms of uh, the enterprise uh, integration process, but also in terms of uh, uh, a, a neat upgradable framework for maintaining the set of work set co work group contracts on the mainnet. Uh, the, in one other area, uh, one primary area over here is how can enterprises delay, or uh, sorry, delegate uh, using delegate transactions or delegate the uh, the responsibility of uh, executing transactions on the mainnet using relays and meta transactions. Uh, these are some of the core development areas, and it's uh, it's been a uh, it's it's been a great uh, uh, great pleasure and also great advances that have been happening in the community because of this. Uh, baseline, I think, has uh, really brought together a lot of the great minds uh, coming together and working in these different areas. And we welcome one and all uh, to come and join us in this uh, initiative. Next, uh, finally, uh, I'll go over some of the community efforts uh, uh, that have been ongoing uh, in, uh, over the past uh, year and also with the advent of Baseline. In terms of community adoption, the Enterprise Ethereum Alliance uh, and the Mean Networking Group is a great uh, uh, is a great uh, is a great set of folks working on different ways in which uh, uh, enterprise uh, community can be brought closer uh, to the mainnet and also working closer with the Ethereum Foundation. Uh, there are separate task forces over here, like Secure Messaging Task Force and Enterprise Use Case Task Force, uh, which are uh, which are currently active to ensure uh, sorry to uh, research and uh, and go deep into how uh, secure private messaging or private uh, channel communication can be maintained and also around multiple use cases across different you know, industries and verticals to come up with standards or templates uh, for workflows and also for having some sort of EIPs or enterprise EIPs for uh, dealing with procurement or insurance or any other verticals that, uh, that usually enterprises deal with. We also have baseline uh, technical and specification steering committees, uh, which are looking at, uh, which conduct uh, the maintenance of baseline and the direction or strategy of baseline uh, by taking in uh, uh, insights, uh, critical feedback from various members. And uh, the areas that are currently looked at is how to enable enterprises to actually immediately integrate their legacy systems or like ERP or compliance, et cetera, 
uh, to be able uh, to uh, a baseline protocol or a baseline specification compliant solution. Other efforts that are uh, that are also underway are around looking at what could be uh, baselined in terms of the circuits or the logical computation, static logical computations that occur off chain uh, uh, under zero knowledge. So those uh, we have, uh, one of the areas that is currently being researched is how an MPC or a multi-party based trusted setup can be enabled for baseline and uh, other, and related options for how secure messaging services can be used. Uh, so all in all, uh, Baseline has been a tremendous, uh, tremendously positive initiative and has been, uh, has been attracting a lot of folks in the, both in terms of research, industry, development, and infrastructure. Uh, to sum it up, uh, I would liken Baseline loosely to something like uh, what's in the video game world or the gaming developer world, uh, like an OpenGL. Like OpenGL is like a, a ongoing specification, continuously gets updated to essentially ensure that multiple major companies can work with a uh, common, uh, common framework for how video game development works. So not, not trying to say that this is the same thing, but loosely speaking, it's a sort of an initiative like OpenGL uh, the, where we are collaborating, where the idea is to collaborate with multiple enterprises, researchers, and consumers alike to come up with an evolving specification to bring enterprises ever closer to the mainnet. Uh, that brings me to the end of the conversation. I'll, uh, I'll pause to open the floor up for questions. Sure, so we got a couple questions. Uh, I'm going to go ahead and narrate those questions and let you guys answer. Um, so the first one, I think this one probably is a, a good question for Patrick. Uh, is there currently or in the future going to be a framework or API similar to Nightlight, but for private business logic? Um, yes, so uh, we're currently, um, the, the entire baseline community is kind of collaborating right now of, uh, on creating a, a baseline library um, that will basically be able to handle, uh, you, would pass the, you would pass it some, your intent for zero knowledge or to construct a specific message and a lot of helper utilities. Uh, we're going to start off with that first and then we're going to branch around that uh, utility, a bunch of more opinionated kind of uh, framework kind of looking things to just make it the entire process a lot easier. But obviously because there's a lot of things that are still up in the air, the community starts to kind of to decide on a couple things. So it'll take a little while to get there, but um, obviously the more people that are involved, the faster we'll get there. But it's, it's definitely something uh, we're planning on doing very, very shortly. Excellent, very exciting. Um, I'm going to direct this one towards Karthik. So uh, could you elaborate on the usage of Merkle trees in the baseline smart contracts? Uh, sorry, I was on my mute. Uh, sure. So Merkle trees uh, uh, are essentially uh, like, uh, like accumulators. Like, um, so uh, I think that there was a great exposition by the R&D team on how to use Merkle trees and how to optimize the usage of Merkle trees. But the idea of using Merkle trees essentially comes from uh, a more uh, basic uh, primitive called accumulators or cryptographic accumulators. They were first used when, uh, like, they were first used when uh, to to timestamp, like, you know, to record intervals of times or, or recording events in some sort of intervals of time. They're applied in membership testing, distributed signatures, many other uh, many other applications uh, for accumulators. Uh, just to reiterate the point, like, you know, when we talk about commitments, we talk about hashing where we take like a set of values in a certain order and the hash to say an integer or a hash to a big uh, number. Now, when we talk about accumulators, it's not uh, a set of uh, variables which are getting committed, but it's multiple sets of such variables or multiple sets of ordered sequences which are committed at once. Uh, in in uh, in a commitment, a prover uh, prover just needs to send a uh, prover sends the secret and a salt to the verifier, and verifier can just open it and uh, verify the message. But in the case of an accumulator, prover just sends sets of messages, or so only parts of the messages, instead of sending the entire message itself. So that the concept here, uh, there's a concept of the set membership and uh, the set non-membership, proof of set membership and proof of non-set membership. So the Merkle tree over there is basically used in uh, in uh, uh, in, uh, uh, in in baseline or even for that matter in general as in, in terms of a mixer, 
to essentially store uh, any business process uh, outputs. Like for example, if you're creating an agreement and you would want to hash that agreement and you know run some zero knowledge proofs around it, and then finally store it on the uh, store it in the Merkle tree. So when you're storing it, in the, uh, when subsequent processes happen and multiple such uh, 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 hashes or commitments are stored, instead of providing the entire Merkle tree to say the verifier to be able to verify every single commitment and also or verify every or go through every single commitment, find the one which is more applicable for them. Uh, accumulators come up with I have a great property that uh, e, a great property that in if you only it's only ever needed to reveal some set of those commitments instead of the all of the set of commitments. So that's how Merkle tree in uh, in baseline is is essentially a, a type of accumulator, wherein only siblings are provided. Uh, and to check for the membership and whether the siblings can actually compute up to the root of the tree, which is publicly available anyway. So that's the idea of using Merkle trees. But in the context of uh, ETH 2.0, uh, this whole, uh, the same concept of accumulators and multiple commitments has been, has been taken into consideration around creation of polynomial commitments and how they could be used for uh, attaining consensus and also ensuring that uh, the, uh, the privacy is maintained. Great, so I'm gonna open up this question to both of you. Um, this question is around um, adding new business processes. What, what does it take to add to baseline an additional uh, business process that's not currently handled? Okay, I, uh, I can take that. Um, so in, uh, in order to, uh, so baseline uh, essentially uh, to reiterate is a specification which consists of some standard or like some underlying libraries or components. So just like how you have commitments and signature verifications, and then you have the whole sequence of the how you would want to layer them up in such a way that you could attain a business process. Similarly, any uh, any extensions of that business process can be applied as well. So that, that's uh, sort of a nuanced uh, answer because there are cases where business logic is just an extension of, sometimes just an extension of uh, just putting together more of those sequences together, but sometimes it is actually changes that need to be affected uh, in the underlying uh, set of components itself. Like for example, change if, uh, if the new organization or if a new member would like to use a different commitment scheme or a different signature, a different mode of using signatures, or different integration points, or even for that matter, different set of contracts they want to deal with. At that point of time, uh, baseline lends itself to creating new work groups and maintaining them in such a way that they, uh, in such a way that they can be handled on the mainnet. In the sense, like there is a lean structure for handling the smart contracts. So effectively, any business process execution is not handled on chain. It is still handled off chain. And on chain, what you do is only verify uh, the proofs of such a private execution. So the lean nature of how the work group contracts is set up, essentially only uh, uh, commits or verifies or proves uh, any off-chain business logic execution. So in essence, any extensions could also lend itself well to on-chain verification. The nuances come on like how off-chain integrations work and that's where I think it's a, uh, it's sort of an implementation consideration and uh, depending on business need and also around uh, uh, choices of the uh, the underlying tools like the queuing systems or uh, the API and uh, the API servers or the database systems, etc. Thank you. Um, so the next question is uh, about the reference implementation of Radish thirty four. So the question is, how are wallets and keys being managed in Radish thirty four? Um, and I'd actually like to extend this question a bit and also. Um, you know, ask, is there a specific recommendation that uh, is, is being, you know, delivered with Radish 34 and Baseline, or are there different options for that? Well, I can probably fill this one. Um, we try not to be uh, opinionated at all about wa wallet management, because it wasn't really what we were trying to accomplish with that specific uh, implementation of, you know, uh, we had a minimum viable product we wanted to try and accomplish. Uh, we also understand that dealing with wallets is as varied as it can get. And 
we wanted to make it as open-ended as possible. So the way that we implemented it in Radish 34 is actually pretty basic. In fact, it should be replaced by something uh, more substantial. But we also know you might want to sign things with uh, MetaMask or you want to use Infura or some other uh, way of signing. it. And also in terms of key management, um, that's something that we didn't want to have specifically in that because it's just, it's so varied and complex. Uh, we do expect uh, other people to write wrappers or other utilities and things to be able to handle that in more streamlined ways that it, it should really be up to um, the implement, imp the, whoever's implementing it primarily. Karthik, anything yeah. to add? Is that Anthony? Uh, I think Patrick covered it well. I think it's definitely uh, a lot of considerations around how uh, things would be uh, exactly implemented in the sense like the choice of the implementation technology and uh, the implementation architecture and so on. But in general, yes, I think uh, the idea is that uh, it's essential to form or come up with a common interface or uh, have a set of uh, at least commonly agree upon standards uh, to be able to interface with uh, any part of the stack. Thank you. Uh, this is the last question we have. So if I was an enterprise and I'd like to extend Radish 34 to integrate with my SAP system, how would I do that? Um, so uh, <clears throat> we stood up on Radish 34, a very simple GraphQL um, uh, inter interface, uh, you would just have that system, I guess, just call a mutation on GraphQL. Um, if you don't like GraphQL and you want to replace it with something that's more RESTful, you can go right ahead and do that. It shouldn't be too problematic. It'll definitely get a lot easier as time goes on as we develop uh, the baseline protocol further with the community itself, of course. Um, so you would just call that, that uh, mutation. And it, it also, in terms of the uh, uh, the, uh, the queue system would also fire off of events. Uh, there can be an entire event listener system that could be stood up very easily to just pass along messages to what, what other legacy systems might have as well. Excellent. Okay, so we're going to now pass it off to Will, who is going to talk about um, implementation of baseline into our uh, ops chain product. Thanks, AJ. Um, so like he just said, my name is Will Kim. Uh, I'm a blockchain developer here at EY, and I'm also the tech lead on the Ops Chain team. So uh, I'm going to be talking about the Ops Chain platform that we're developing and specifically why we chose to implement Baseline. Um, so if we can move uh, and talk about what makes Baseline stand out from other blockchain solutions, is that it's both future forward, but it also keeps in mind the current uh, state of blockchain. For example, companies aren't gonna want to replace their existing tech stack right now. And who knows you know, if they'll ever replace the whole thing. Like in the news right now, you'll see a lot of, about how a lot of companies are still using COBOL, right? Uh, but with baseline, we can leverage the advantages that blockchain provides by letting the blockchain layer sit on top of the tech stack rather than replace it entirely. Um, baseline also integrates, integrates zero-knowledge proofs, which let companies conduct business on the public Ethereum mainnet, which is something that we at EY identify as a major priority for blockchain development. And in order to make our mainnet vision come true, we need to allow interoperability with other baseline applications, because what's the point of being on a network if you can't talk to anybody else? Um, so the next thing we're going to talk about is the components that make up baseline and uh, they can be broken down into these three things and we're just going to get right into them. So let's start with the last thing on the list, which is secure messaging. The messaging service sends messages to all relevant parties containing private application data. Uh, Radish 34, for example, utilized Whisper as its messaging layer, which is Ethereum's decentralized messaging service. But the specific implementation of messaging can take on a variety of forms. OpsChain uses an internal centralized messaging service for transaction speed and durability, but we do plan on integrating a decentralized messaging service in the future. But regardless of how the messages are sent, the data in those messages um, what's important is they can be checked against the blockchain. 
that ensures data integrity and that everybody is working off of the same information. So speaking of the blockchain, um, now we're gonna talk about the blockchain itself. So over the years, we and the entire blockchain community have figured out a lot of ways to use blockchain to validate and ensure data integrity by using things like hashes, digital signatures, and other techniques. But we at EY have been at the forefront of conducting zero-knowledge transactions against the Ethereum mainnet. And it's this work in zero-knowledge proofs that lets Baseline work against both private and public networks. And given the choice between the two, OpsChain is targeted to work against the public network. The reason for this is that we uh, think of blockchains kind of like how the world thinks of the internet today. We don't have a dozen segmented internets, right? We have just the internet. So we want to make sure that when we connect to blockchain, we're connecting to the blockchain, which is why we put so much emphasis on the public Ethereum mainnet. Uh, finally, I want to briefly discuss the zero knowledge proofs, which is what lets us work on the mainnet in the first place. While there's other organizations that can do private transactions in limited uh, capacity, we're at the forefront of building entire private applications that utilize um, private contracts. And we call these zero knowledge circuits, which is, you can kind of think of them as like smart contracts that are able to conduct business logic under zero knowledge. We have a number of these circuits built out already for OpsChain, and over time, we're, we plan on building additional circuits that can be used as a set of tools to make the development of future circuits easier. And over time, we hope to build an extensive library of these circuits. Now, with all of that said, uh, I want to turn it over to Marco, who is the product owner of OpsChain, so that he can give you guys a more in-depth look of OpsChain itself. Thanks, Will. Uh, my name is Marco Bedour. I've been the product owner on Radish 34, which is the reference implementation of the baseline protocol. And I'm currently the product owner on OpsChain, which, as AJ mentioned, is our flagship blockchain application here at UI. During the specific part of the conversation, I will be covering three key sections. First, I will be providing you an overview of the OpsChain application and how it fits into EY's greater vision of using public blockchains for private business transactions. Second, I'll be going over our roadmap and I will be covering select features in some more detail so that you have an idea as to what features to expect to be released in the upcoming months. Lastly, I'm going to switch gears and provide you with a demo of the current OpsChain product. This is an advanced application that is rapidly maturing and the development team is currently iterating and improving on the product as we're speaking. This would also be a, a good point in time to quickly pause and recognize the efforts of the development team. I may be the voice and face of the OpsChain platform, but there's a strong team behind me that has done the heavy lifting in order to ensure privacy and confidentiality on the public mainnet. Now, with that being said, let's take a look at the OpsChain platform and what OpsChain actually is. Now, at its core, OpsChain is EY's enterprise software as a service business appli blockchain application that allows companies to transact private and secure business transactions on the public mainnet by using the latest advancements in zero knowledge proofs. Now, OpsChain is part of the blockchain.ui.com platform, which we will hear about more in a little bit, and it is also a baseline compatible product. But I do want to point out here that OpsChain goes beyond being a simple procurement application. You've heard about Radish 34, which basically showed you the RFP issuance to purchase order issuance stages of an RFP workflow. Within OpsChain, we're going to greatly expand on that procurement workflow to make it end-to-end -end, but we're also going to be able to host different business applications on this platform. So at its core, OpsChain is a platform that allows, you, that allows you to subscribe to different business applications, which can be both current or new UI products, so that you have a one-stop shop for all of your business needs. Well, let's take a look at some of these business applications in more detail. You heard Paul Brody on Tuesday talk about the EY procurement network. Ultimately, this is going to give you access to an end-to-end -end procurement workflow from RFP issuance to issuing an invoice and settling payments all on-chain on the public mainnet. Now, there are other business applications that we plan to migrate into the off-chain platform as the solution matures. 
These are both current and new blockchain platforms that we've developed at EY, such as the Global Trade and Origins business application, public financial management, or the intercompany settlement process. Now that we have a good understanding of what type of applications we'll be hosting on this platform, let's take a look at how a user would actually gain access to these applications. We uh, took a very conscious effort at EY to design the ops chain platform in a very modular way so that you only need to subscribe to the features that actually solve your current business challenges. This basically means that subscription to features gives you access to different business applications and you can pick and choose which features you want to subscribe to. Lastly, I want to talk about a few integrations that we have planned with this platform. You're going to find your usual suspect of ERP integrations for SAP, Oracle, and other ERP modules, but we want to take things a little bit further and also integrate with EDIs to streamline the document transfer and to also integrate with other EY blockchain products so that customers can benefit from the full suite of our solution offerings. So now that we have a good understanding of what the ops chain platform is, let me spend some time talking about our roadmap. Now what you see on this slide right here are features that we are currently planning to release in the upcoming months. This can be broadly categorized into the procurement as a service feature, again, giving you access to the UI procurement network, tokenization and notarization features to take advantages of blockchain's immutable record keeping and the ability to transfer tokens, you then have traceability as a service, right, which is your typical logistics supply chain feature, and then contract management as a service and ERP integrations. In the next two slides, I'll spend some more time going into some of these features in more detail. All right, so looking at these two releases here, we see the first feature being procurement as a service. Like I mentioned, this is going to be an end-to-end -end procurement workflow from RFP to invoice payments. We've done some of this work in Radish 34, but we have designed OpsChain in a different technical architecture, it being a SaaS business application and also being multi-tenant. So ultimately, we're gonna take the learning experience from Radish and modify what has worked and what hasn't worked in order to give you end-to-end -end procurement for OpsChain. Now, I do wanna point out though that for this specific release, it is not just going to be a procurement workflow. We also want to provide you with the base infrastructure and foundation to easily scale the solution by making it very user friendly to invite and add new business partners and to also be able to separate and create multiple user roles under a single organization. Moving along, let's talk about ERP integrations. Now, ERP integrations are, is a hot topic nowadays and you might ask yourself why that is. Well, there's a few reasons, but to mention one, Think about having transactions occurring on the blockchain and then having to go back and manually enter these into your journal, right? That would kind of not lead to automation, but quite the opposite effect. So by being able to integrate with ERP modules, you can do a few things. You can directly in real time record transactions that have happened on chain into your journals to streamline financial and management reporting. And we're talking about things such as procurement certain data elements such as price are always maintained in your ERP source system. So you also wanna have a connection to those so that you have an integrated platform that really allows you to do a process end to end. Now in the past, we at UI have integrated successfully with the SAP intercompany module of a Fortune 100 healthcare company. And this was done on a prior version of OpsChain, OpsChain 2.0, and it happened on a private blockchain network. So what we're in the process of doing now is to take the lessons learned from that past use case and to work with our deep uh, sector experience in our SAP practice at EY to bring you an integration for the procurement module for the first release of the EY procurement network. Here we're targeting to integrate with the four core procurement modules of contracting, sourcing, accounts payable, and invoices and payments. Other procurement modules that we plan to release in the future are dependent on which business applications we start migrating over to the ops chain platform first. Let's look at these two releases in a bit more detail here, and then we're gonna switch over to the demo. So first, let's talk about traceability and tokenization as a service. These actually are two separate features, so I'm also gonna segment them and talk about them sequentially. First, let's talk about traceability. Right? When most people think about traceability in their mind, they're thinking about tokenizing a product and then tracking its physical location as it moves through the supply chain. 
via a combination of QR codes, RFIDs, and the blockchain. Now, we've done that on private blockchains, both during the uh, EY wine blockchain implementation, which allows you to track the bottle of wine all the way down to the farmer who has harvested the grape, and in a recent collaboration with Canadian Blood Services, where we've improved the visibility of the blood donor and transfusion process. Now, again, these things happened on a private blockchain, and we're now working heavily on to moving these things over onto our public blockchain platform, which is our off-chain solution. Lastly, let me talk about tokenizations here. So tokenizations, yes, you can tokenize products to track them, but for off-chain, we want to take things a little bit further. Ideally, we want to um, tokenize things such as purchase orders, right? It's a different asset class. And the reason for why we want to do that is so that you will be able to engage in a process called PO financing. So the token of the purchase order represents legal ownership of the purchase order. And then you can, you can then go to your trusted financial institutions and basically collateralize the purchase order to secure a loan to issue future purchase orders to your business partners. And that's just one example as to the different tokenization efforts that we're currently um, thinking about and planning to bring to this platform. Now, lastly, let's talk about the contract management as a service feature. This ultimately is going to provide you with a contract manager on the public Ethereum mainnet that allows you to draft, negotiate, sign, and amend contract terms and conditions. Now, we've done that in the past for a Fortune 50 oil and gas company, where we used the OpsChain contract manager, the prior version of OpsChain 4.0, in order to streamline and improve the contractor billing process. You may have also heard about our collaboration with Microsoft around the rights and royalties process, which ultimately takes the similar idea of using smart contracts to automate, to automate business logic based on token events or other data feeds. What we're in the process of doing right now is to identify key features and functionalities of the Opschain contract manager and how we can best migrate them over to Opschain 4.0 to give you this end-to-end -end contract management workflow. All right, with that being said, we now have a good understanding of what OpsChain is, and we'll have a Q&A session later in case there's still open questions. And we have an idea of what features we plan to share in the next few months. So now we're in a good position to switch over to the live demo, which is the first time that we're sharing this product with the outside world. All right, so in order to do this, I will Share, we share my screen. And the first thing that you'll notice here is that I'm currently on the blockchain.ui.com website. Now, like I mentioned, OpsChain is a product that is part of blockchain.ui.com, which means that once you sign into this website, you've been credentialized and authorized or authenticated, and you can use these user credentials to access more than just the OpsChain platform. So in order to navigate to OpsChain, I will click this right-hand navigation button here and then navigate down to the OpsChain tab. Once I've clicked on the OpsChain tab, I'm going to be redirected to this landing page. And there's a few things that you'll notice when first being directed here. First, in the top right-hand corner, you see the company name. Right now, the company name is Marco and & Company, and I registered this organization prior to the demo by entering my company name and Ethereum address, my public Ethereum address, in case I'm gonna make calls to the blockchain or other smart contracts. On the left-hand side here, you see the main navigation handle or navigation bar for this application, which will separate into the top section and the bottom section. In the top, you see the opportunity to visit a dashboard, which the team is iterating and working on as we're speaking. And you also see different document types that users can send between one another. This would be requests for proposals, RFPs, purchase orders, and invoices. The second half or the second bottom here of this navigation screen talks about different products and partners that you can add to a listing view so that for future document issuance, you can select them from a dropdown. Additionally, you'll be able to, to view both inactive and active contracts. And when clicking on the tokens tab, you would see a listing of all tokens that you're currently holding, both as physical and legal ownership representations of certain asset classes. So the four key features that I'll be demonstrating during this demo are gonna be as follows. First, I'll be adding a business partner. Then I'm gonna be switching gears and going into the RFP workflow, where I'm gonna show three key features, being the RFP creation, responding to an RFP, 
and then also creating a contract off of a proposal that I've received from one of my business partners. So with that being said, the first thing I'm going to be doing is to navigate to the partners listing view. And you see that there's already two partners in here, which again, we've added for the sake of this demo. But more important are the uh, column headings here. So you see the partner name, the status, which refers to whether or not you have an active or inactive contract with that partner. And then you also see additional data such as the last transaction date and the total transaction sum. Now, in order to add a business partner, I click on this tab up here and I will enter the business partner's name. Let's just say Alec and Company, who is another developer on this project. And I will enter his public Ethereum address that he shared with me. Once I click Save, this business partner will be added to my listing and I'm now free to issue a request for proposal to all of these three business partners. So now that we've basically done the setup process of this demo, which was signing into blockchain.ui.com, registering an organization and adding a business partner, let's go through the actual RFP workflow. So in order to do that, I'm gonna click on the request for proposals tab here. And again, you see that there's two existing proposals in here that specify the request for proposal ID, the name of the RFP, and then the business partner with whom I'm transacting and the status. Status either being open or closed, depending on whether or not you've already created a contract off of the specific feature. Now, in order to create an RFP, I'm gonna click on this top right button here and I can specify the following fields. So let's just say this RFP is for silver. Let's assume that I want the silver pretty quickly given current market conditions. So let's say May 31st. And down here, I can specify the product SKU both in numerical and alphabetical order uh, or character. So let's just say S531. And I can also enter a product description here. Uh, so let's say one kilogram bars. And I can add two suppliers to send this RFP to. And let me send this RFP to Alec, who I've just added. And let me also send this RFP to Will, who you've heard about, who, you, who you've heard speak earlier. Okay, upon sub hitting the submit RFP button, the RFP is going to be sent to my business partners and it will show up in this listing view. So down here, you see the last RFP that I've created for silver. Now let's actually look at the second feature that I'm going to demonstrate, which is the RFP response feature, and what I'm actually doing within that. So once I, in order to actually respond to an RFP, what I need to do is I need to click in the RFP ID to be redirected to its detailed view. Here you see that I've received an RFP with a response date of April 23rd, and it is for 60 inch televisions. Now what I can do as a user is respond with a proposal, basically volume tiers and associated price levels. Now before I do that, let me quickly pause and point one thing out. In most applications or in most blockchain demos that you've seen, usually a user has to always switch accounts. So you have a buyer account or a supplier account, and then it just, results in a pretty messy demo that's not very user-friendly. The reason why we don't have to do this in our off-chain platform is because we've designed it to be user agnostic since we are aware of the fact that specifically when dealing with procurement, most organizations uh, engage in both the buying and the selling aspect of it. So in the back of the mind, this is basically the supplier's perspective that I'm currently performing. But like I've mentioned, this is a user agnostic um, application. All right, so in order to create the proposal, I click the Create Proposal button, and I can specify two fields. One, I can specify the upper volume for the, for the tiers and the associated price level. So let's say from one to 99 TVs, I'm gonna charge $100. Clicking this plus button, I can add another tier. Let's say from 100 to 199, I'm gonna charge $80, just a 20% discount. And then from 200 to 299, let me just charge $50. Actually give a little bit of a steeper discount the more units the specific buyer intends to purchase. Now, once I click the submit proposal button, you will see that the rate table has updated in the detailed view and the proposal has been sent to my business partner who can now choose to create a contract off of this proposal if he feels that I've given him a fair offer. All right, so that was the second key feature that I wanted to demonstrate for the RFP flow. Let's talk about the last feature, which resolves around creating a contract off of an incoming RFP response. So this specific RFP here, again, I send out prior to the demo, 
This was for gold and specifically for 10 ounce gold bars. And I've sent this to both Will and Tyler. In the status column here, you see that I received a response from both of my suppliers already, but it is not mandatory to have two uh, received responses to create a contract, but probably makes sense. And the reason why I'm saying that is because ultimately what I'm looking at here is the comparison between the volume and price per unit that these two suppliers have provided me with. I'm gonna choose the one that gives me the most favorable terms, which is going to be Will and Company. And in order to create a contract off of this RFQ response, I'm going to click the Actions button and hit Create Contract. Now here I am being provided with an overview of the proposal that was initially sent to me. And I can just review the volume and price terms and specify the contract start date. Let's just say that is going to be today, April 23rd. And let's assume that I want this contract to end, why don't we say four months from now in July 31st. Now, once I've specified all of this and I'm happy with what I'm seeing for this in this contract here, I can click create contract, which is ultimately going to send the draft contract to my supplier who can review and sign it if he likes the terms that, I, that he's originally proposed and is uh, okay with the contract start and end date. Now, if I'm going back into the uh, request for proposals listing, you see that the contract status for this specific um, RFP has just changed from open to close since I've created a contract off of this RFP response. Additionally, once the draft contract has been created, you as a user will be able to see the contract in your contracts listing view, again, specifying the contract ID, business partner, the product SKU, here was for G424, which represents goal, as well as the MSA start and end date. Lastly, you see I'm awaiting supplier signature, which would then be the extension of the MSA workflow. Now, I want you to keep in mind that all of this has happened via a combination of private messaging and zero knowledge proofs to ensure privacy and security on the public mainnet. We're iterating on this, pro on this product as we're speaking and we'll be gladly sharing additional releases and potentially a beta version with the greater public in the near future. This is going to uh, conduct this demo and I'm gonna open the floor for a Q&A session now. Thanks, Marco. So we did receive a couple of questions. Um, one you just touched on a little bit and I'll just answer this in a little bit more detail. Um, but someone asked if I can log in as a developer to play. So the answer is currently we are not uh, opening up the solution to the public, um, but we are considering the future uh, releasing a, uh, a beta release similar to how we did with the, uh, the review tool. Um, this next question, I think uh, my, Will might be able to answer well. Um, does Opschain give the ability to design custom business workflows baked into private smart contracts by any chance? Um, so currently, um, currently Opschain only offers the functionality that we've built out. But uh, I wouldn't rule that out for a future release. You know, no promises. Uh, I guess that's the best I can say. Yeah, I can maybe jump in here as well and try to answer part of it. So I've mentioned being able to host different business applications on the off-chain platform. Now, these can be either large applications, business applications, such as global trade origins or public financial management, but it can also be specific subsections of an entire process, such as the intercompany settlement process, right? That is just a small piece of a larger business flow. And we would obviously need to do some additional thinking in order to ensure privacy and smart contract integration with this. But it's definitely something that uh, is on our radar and that we're planning to release as the months proceed. Thanks, Marco. Uh, I'll open this up to either of you. Um, within the end-to-end -end workflow, how can something like the acceptance of a vendor's software deliverable be handled within the ops chain scope? Sorry, could you repeat that? Yeah, so within the end to end workflow, um, what was presented in OpsChain, how can something like the acceptance of a vendor's software deliverable? So I'm assuming instead of the procurement being of a physical good, being a digital asset, be handled within the OpsChain scope. Right, uh, I can take the first stab at answering that. So, um, 
you have to think about two things, right? If you have an actual physical good in reality, you could um, tokenize that good and then raise an invoice once you have a goods received notification, right? So it's basically waiting for the good to uh, arrive at your facility, and then you raise an invoice against it and do the settlement process. Now, when we talk about digital products, um, there's two approaches that can potentially be taken. We haven't settled on one specifically, but you could either initiate payment and the invoice issuance as soon as the digital good or the software has been sent from the supplier to the buyer, or you could um, tokenize the, the digital good if you would want to as well, and then only initiate the invoice once you've actually um, received, I guess, the access code for the specific software or are actually able to use it. So there's multiple ways to integrate it, and we're still exploring how to do that in more detail. Thank you, Marco. Um, again, this question's open to both of you. Uh, do you foresee regulations such as GDPR slowing down or inhibiting uh, development or adoption of um, public blockchain technology in general? Yeah, I could take a shot at that one. Um, so we are building uh, blockchain.ey.com and OpsChain with GDPR in mind. Um, we actually don't really see this as a hindrance to writing blockchain applications in particular, because um, as I guess an architectural principle, we avoid having uh, personally identifiable information on the blockchain as much as possible, not just because of GDPR and things like that, but uh, we just don't think that that kind of information should live on the blockchain forever. At least we don't take decisions like that lightly. So um, yeah, we don't think that it's that large of a hindrance to us. Thanks, Will. Uh, this question also uh, is, is, I think, more up your alley. Uh, based on your experience. So the question is, how difficult are zero knowledge proofs to work with? Um, the, the honest answer is uh, pretty hard. Um, we're, we're not at the forefront of ZKPs because they're easy, right? Um, and a lot of them right now are being written by our specialist coders in London. But uh, as time goes on and we get better and better at it, we're hoping that we're gonna develop tools to make things easier on us uh, regular devs, you know, as well as people outside of our group entirely. And um, I actually just got a message from Chitanya who said that um, this is something that they are taking very seriously, like to figure out how to make these things either more generic or possibly easier to write or composable, whatever the final um, it ends up being, it's definitely a concern for us, yeah. Yeah, and it, it seems like you started to touch on this, but a follow-on question to that was, um, you know, what strategy, uh, what is the strategy for greater enterprise adoption uh, with zero knowledge proofs? Um, do you want to th take this one, Marco, or do you want me to? Yeah, sure. I, I can start talking about it and then you can fill in any gaps that there may be. So in order to, to push for an enterprise adoption, right, you, you really have to make sure that, first of all, enterprises are comfortable with how you're handling their data. So again, the key concepts of privacy, security, confidentiality, all of these need to just be very clearly thought out and that's your base. Once companies, I would say, are comfortable with how their data is being handled, you need to provide them with an infrastructure that's gonna scale easily. There's nothing more frustrating than paying for a new application that's full of bugs and that's, that's not really solving your business problem. So being able to have a scalable solution that's also flexible, meaning it's not very brittle, you can, you can easily modify it and upgrade it. It's definitely gonna be um, a key, key issue that we're evaluating. Now, as it relates to SNARK circuits, obviously this, we're at the forefront of this, but there's still a lot of work that needs to be done. So ultimately that and getting enterprises to understand what ZK proofs actually are, is probably one of the bigger media challenges that we're having. But down the line, I think we're very well positioned to push for enterprise adoption with the product that we're developing. Yeah, and um, to add on to that, I think that um, by following the baseline protocol, I think is a really good way to help enterprise adoption as well. Because like I said before, you know, nobody's going to throw out their existing tech stack and like just put everything on the blockchain, right? It's just not really feasible from a technical point of view. So like 
by baselining things, um, I, I think it's a really great way to ease people in into block um, into using blockchain. And as we, and by we I mean like not only blockchain devs but like a global economy, we really start using blockchain. I think the barrier to entry, both like psychological and financial, are going to start to go down. So I, I do think that baseline is what. Um, will really start like getting enterprise adoption going. And I have two somewhat related questions. Um, who is the target market for ops chain and who do we expect the early adopters to be? Mm, right. Um, target market definitely going to be enterprises of any shape, size or form, given that we are UI obviously going for like the fortune 500 fortune 1000 companies is probably going to be our first target market. But um, it's, it's really everyone that's interested in blockchains and it wants to take, in, t take an advantage of the current technology that is out there and that believes in our vision of using public, the public Ethereum mainnet for business transactions. Um, I think there was a second part to that question that I may have missed, if you can re restate that. Yeah, so it was very related. It was who is the target market and then who do we expect the early adopters to be? Hmm. Early adopters, I mean, right, this is just a wild guess, but I would assume companies that are very comfortable with technology themselves that may themselves have R&D departments that deal with blockchain technology, intelligent automation or AI, pretty much any company that is comfortable being an early adopter, comfortable with new technology, and that sees the value in what we're building here. Thanks, Marco. I think we have time for one more question. Um, where we've implemented the solution, have you seen any costly processes such as uh, accounts receivable, payable, and reconciliations go away? And I guess since we're uh, early in at least the development of Opchain 4.0, maybe it might be more accurate to say, do we expect to see and, and maybe how, um, or if you have any information on uh, older versions of Opchain, if we've seen that, you can answer in that way too. Yeah, sure. So. Um... Like you said, the Opschain platform was still in active development. So let's talk about past versions of Opschain and how we've actually improved some of these core accounting processes. So our most famous uh, solution that many of you have heard about is the Microsoft Rights and Royalties project, project that is currently in production. And what we've done there is to streamline the, I'm, I'm, I, I don't want to say the wrong thing here, but we've streamlined, I believe it was the collection period all the way from 45 minute, 45 days down to sheer minutes. So that's a way where you can definitely see how the execution of smart contracts and the automatic execution of that business logic in and of itself is just going to streamline your very rudimentary rule-based accounting processes because you can just code them in a flow and then let the smart contract execute that business logic once there's been a trigger event. So definitely this is going to be great, greatly improve the financial accounting and reporting processes. No question about it. All right. Thank you, guys. And uh, thank everyone for joining uh, our presentation. I'll pass it back. Thank you, AJ. That, that was terrific. And uh, of course, uh, I want to finish off with a, a sincere compliment to the team there. Uh, truly amazing work from that team. And for me, what's really exciting about this is it is very, very unremarkable stuff that's happening in a public blockchain. What's remarkable about this is how uh, fundamental this technology is and how simple it is designed to be used um, uh, as well. So with that, uh, I'm very excited. We're going to have our final, this is our final break. Uh, we've got Hudson back. And honestly, it's important that this is the final break because I am running out of t-shirts uh, and that that is not a good thing. So. Um, Hudson, just give us your sense of, of uh, kind of uh, what you saw here and, and what your reaction is. Yeah, so this is incredibly exciting. Uh, disclaimer, I'm on the technical steering committee for baseline, so I'm going to be very biased and say this is an incredible development. <laughs> um, I think that as more use cases get put on baseline, it's going to grow in prominence. Um, not to say it hasn't already accomplished a lot, but you know, what's really needed is a diverse set of use cases and uh, business processes that can be put on there. 
the fact that they're utilizing zero knowledge proofs every step of the way is very impressive. That's a really difficult thing to ascertain uh, in general. Just zero knowledge proofs are really hard. You have to be cryptography experts pretty much to get them. So that's my uh, initial reaction. So, uh, and, and indeed, you know, because of that question, the question came up, you know, why, is there any way to make this easy? I think in the short run, the answer is, we're not yet sure if there's any way to make ZKPs super simple, but with uh, blockchain.ey.com and baseline, one of our objectives is to hide some of the complexity behind a simple API. Like even though everything in there is using zero knowledge proofs, the user interface, you could have lifted that straight out of any traditional web-based procurement system. And that is, <clears throat> that's the goal is it should look relatively straightforward. If you're a procurement person, you shouldn't have to know any advanced math in order to, to do this, right? What you should care about is how to do, how to do this uh, uh, through a, uh, a value proposition where you have kind of step downs for volume discounts. And indeed, the, one of the key things that, that was going through our heads as we designed this was, this should be a relatively straightforward use case. Um, I, I think I, I like procurement because it's really important to go from, uh, uh, it, it's a way in which companies transact with each other very traditionally. Um, Hudson, you're obviously on the steering committee baseline, you see the Ethereum Foundation. What other use cases have you been thinking about or have you seen others talking about that we think we'll start to get to? You know, um, I really like use cases that involve uh, on-chain oracles. So uh, things that maybe are prediction markets or uh, things like that. Some of the first use cases, and these aren't really necessarily enterprise focused, but gambling is gonna be one of the first ones um, just because, you know, that's what the internet is used for for a lot of people around the world. Uh, as far as enterprise ones go, uh, stuff with attestations and maybe like something like a universal credit report, something where you break down silos and you have these, uh, what, what, is, what would previously be unique data that would be siloed into this one company and need to go through six different processes to be shared uh, comes down to just one system, the main net. And you can have different tools dealing with it, but as long as you do, you know, an EIP standard, like a token standard, like ERC-20 with it, you can swap assets, information, data of any kind and have it, you know, packed up in a zero knowledge proof for privacy and it just goes back and forth seamlessly. So uh, that's why I challenge people who say that blockchains are only a database because there's a lot more you can do with them than that. Well, you touched on kind of what we always talk about as kind of the two key conditions for blockchain to be useful. Number one, you've got to have multiple parties that are, that are sharing information in a business transaction. And number two, uh, especially useful is when you have shared business logic. And one of the other key design points in the network procurement solution is this idea that if you're an enterprise, right, and we didn't really show this in the demo, but if you're an enterprise, one of the things you can do is you can easily add and remove companies from this master contract. So if you acquire a new subcontracting partner, you can make them an authorized buyer in this environment and then they can go and access your volume purchase agreement without seeing the underlying data, without seeing who else is buying what, uh, but we can mathematically guarantee a company that no matter who's doing the buying, everyone who's authorized to do so is always getting the maximum available discount. And so I believe this is one of those things where it's not necessarily the fanciest feature, but it's one where we can go to, to chief procurement officers and say, this is going to drive a very specific and, and, and measurable return on investment. Um, you obviously uh, sit with baseline, it's really at the intersection of the EEA, the Enterprise Ethereum Association, and the Ethereum Foundation. Talk to me a little bit about sort of the differing roles of the Ethereum Foundation versus the EEA. Yes, that's a really great question. So Baseline is actually not an EEA product um, exactly. It's more of an, it's actually under OASIS, which is a standards body. Uh, they've been incredibly helpful for us, by the way. OASIS is a great organization. They do uh, different standards. Go ahead and look them up. But we have it under OASIS. And then the EEA uh, has dedicated different resources to support that. Uh, as has the uh, EF with people being on the technical steering committee and 
other types of, um, you know, more managerial, managerial roles. So um, I would say that what we do is we come in and we advise kind of directions on where they should go from an EF and EEA perspective. But if you're asking about what the differences are, I think that the Ethereum Foundation is usually more focused on uh, public goods and getting, you know, the low level protocol stuff and some of the middleware uh, like ENS and different like Remix, which is a Solidity uh, IDE, getting all that together and funded and developed is something that the EF's more focused on than a lot of the enterprise use cases, but that's where the EEA comes in. So they complement each other very, very well. And uh, we're excited to be a part of that. The executive director of the Ethereum Foundation, Aya Miyaguchi, is on the board. Um, so uh, yeah, we, we're very intertwined, but at the same time know our, our, our places. So one of the things I've been thinking about is, you know, for EY, getting to scalable privacy and private business logic start to unlock this like torrent of business use cases that we've been thinking about. And our, our biggest problem is just kind of the developer backlog. I, I assume that something similar is going on with the Ethereum Foundation, which is to say, you know, ETH 2.0 is a huge major milestone. It's coming up very, very quickly. But once we're there, I, I have to believe based on looking at all the EIPs, there's a ton of other kind of small and medium sized improvements that are, are, are set behind that. And, Maybe you can talk to me a little bit about what, what some of the thinking is about what the priorities are going to be for the Ethereum Foundation. Sure. So as far as the Ethereum Foundation goes, um, our whole ethos is taking a step back, uh, a method of subtraction, you could say, where we want the community to thrive and we don't want to interject too much from a, like, level of making all the decisions and doing that. It was, it was kind of necessary when there was just the Ethereum Foundation, but now we're at a point where all of these other groups and organizations like Consensus and Gnosis and the EEA come together with different decisions. And we also have multiple clients involved that are not all EF. So uh, with that being said, though, the leadership role that we do take is we do hire and uh, utilize a lot of researchers and developers for Ethereum 2.0, like you alluded to, and it is something where getting the resources to have that cross-disciplinary person come in and understand, hit the ground running and understand blockchain to begin with, and then going a step deeper and understanding, you know, some of the protocol and low-level core components, and then going a step deeper and understanding the economics and the, uh, you know, different like privacy features and different mathematical formulas. And it gets really deep really quickly so uh we found some of the best people in the world to tackle this uh very humble people people who have a lot of accomplishments but you might not see them as name name brand people and uh we're excited to have those people um if you want to get involved if you're seeing this and you think you can contribute feel free to reach out uh to myself or um other people for an enterprise perspective perspective we have uh Tosh Dienes, uh, who is um, the chairman of the Ethereum uh, Enterprise Alliance main networking group. And then I also handle a lot of um, liaison work between different developers and researchers and things like that. So reach out. Uh, we, uh, we will do that. And this is a question that we actually get a lot, which is how to get started. So I thank you for answering that one. Now, last year, we heard this goal, a million blockchain developers on Solidity what are you guys doing to make that a reality? Because we want to see a million developers as well. Oh, yeah. So what we're doing to make that a reality is we are making a lot of, well, really, blockchain and Ethereum in particular is an exciting field in general. So what we're trying to do is we're trying to work with different organizations and, like, go to conferences that aren't traditionally blockchain conferences and recruit there. Uh, we're also rebooting a lot of our meetup programs. That's... Um, something that we have a few grants out for within the Ethereum Foundation for people to go in and revitalize those meetup programs and go into non-traditional meetup spaces like FinTech meetups and things like that to get people from all different perspectives, including an economics, financial, and mathematical uh, perspective. So I, I think we'll get there, and I think we'll get there not only because we're like busting our butts trying to get a million developers in the next few years, but because Ethereum is going to be so prolific and such an underlying technology, it's going to be like saying, 
you know, 15 years ago, we want a million internet developers. Like now it seems like, oh, that's like simple. Like there's definitely, you know, up to a million internet developers, but it seems so far away, but so close at the same time to say, we're going to get a ton of Ethereum developers over the next few years. Absolutely. What else would you say are the big strategic priorities? So just, uh, I, we're about to go into our final section here, but I want to give you a chance to give a little bit of a closing statement. Tell us a little bit about kind of the big strategic priorities of the Ethereum Foundation going forward and where, where you would, if you're, you've got, you know, hundreds and what will probably ultimately be several thousand people watching this on the replays, what would be your message to them about how to help drive the Ethereum ecosystem forward? So as far as driving the Ethereum ecosystem forward, speak up on Reddit, on Twitter, get involved if you're a developer in open source software, uh, push forward the conversation. Um, a lot of this, a lot of people just lurk on the forums and lurk on the chat rooms and messages and or message systems, and we just need a lot more participation, I'd say. From an Ethereum Foundation perspective, we have had a lot of success recently uh, improving our ecosystem support program, which used to be our grants program. Uh, if you go to ecosystem.support, you can learn more about some bounties we have on some really hard math and cryptographic problems. You can also learn about applying for a grant or seeing our grantees through our blog post. So just supporting the ecosystem is a really important part, and uh, you can just see what people around you are doing on Twitter and Telegram and stuff like that, and uh, just get involved. Fantastic. Well, I have to agree with you strongly about the Reddit recommendation. Uh, you know, it is definitely one of the best environments where you can find really smart people who know their stuff. When we publish stuff on the, in the Reddit forums, especially each finance and Ethereum, we get very, very focused, smart, thoughtful questions occasionally difficult. I was hoping for easier questions, but we get, we get fairly challenging questions. So with that, Hudson, I want to thank you so much for joining us.